good morning everybody we have so far hosted 40 um, webinars this is the 41st one and uh, today we have one of the very famous eminent uh, lawyer of madras high court uh, ms geeta ramaswamy she enrolled as an advocate in the year 1982 and is now practicing at chennai high court madras high court in the area of criminal law family law and civil law and uh, uh, ms geeta has worked extensively with women and children and has represented women living with hiv aids survivors of custodial violences women children who are survivors of um, sexual harassment and uh, under trial prisoners juvenile children and minority groups who face a kind of discrimination and she has been a special public prosecutor for the cba for 15 years and has been invited by the national judicial academy at bhopal to deliver lectures on various subjects she is one of the trained mediators of the mediation center at the madras high court and was also the joint secretary first joint secretary of the madras high court mediation center she has been part of various campaigns on law reforms also and she is a hinds follow from fellow from university of pittsburgh usa and did her fellowship on comparative law in area of constitutional law family law and criminal law she has been a guest faculty in department of criminology university of madras where she taught criminal law and human rights law to lot of students currently she is an adjunct faculty at asian college of journalism chennai which is a coveted institution where she teaches a course on media law and society she has co-authored a book on child and law and has written many papers and articles on various legal topics she has been a consultant for the unicef and did a study on the juvenile system for state of bihar and the undp where she has provided inputs and wrote a background paper on gender equality in justice system of south asia implications for human development if i go on adding the feathers in the cap of ms geeta ramaswamy time may be a constraint ma'am we are delighted and proud to have you as a resource person now you can start the forum is yours thank you uh, i i thought negotiating relationships today as a topic was a challenge because family law evolved as a legislation in the 50s and maybe a bit earlier than that but today what you see is that it has come through in various foras posing a big challenge to lawyers as well as to uh, judges first the challenge is to box emotions within the framework of law how does one do it you know a large part of legis a large part of parties when they come to you are highly emotional so boxing emotions in the framework of law is a big challenge the second challenge would be how do we create it as a right are we going to look at it as a right are we going to look at it as a, a area where there has to be gender justice because we know that there can be some amount of inequality are we only then going to look at it as a litigation where you know you think parties are there they come to you with some kind of a problem and you are there to just settle the dispute or take it to a litigation now you also need as we know a very creative understanding of evidence in this fora you know it is not just a normal civil litigation where you have a large amount of evidence in the form of documents though today you tend to have documents in the form of hundreds of emails exchanged between parties but does an email sent in a fit of anger amount to an evidence as it would be in a civil litigation is a next challenge that we need to understand now further if we go our entire law is adversarial in nature i mean i know you've had earlier sessions on this but 
I am bound to repeat it in some way to give us some understanding. If you take, for example, Hindu law as well as Christian law, one of the crucial areas or the maximum areas in which litigations are filed is on the basis of cruelty. Now, how does one, and of course today adultery, but how does one understand cruelty? This is a big challenge. A fit of temper. You know, a litigant would come and tell you that um, my husband hit me. She would also tell you that, but you know, I lost my temper and we did have some amount of a dispute. But as a lawyer, if you were to take the earlier behavior of the litigant, namely that she, I wouldn't say contributed, but there was a fight. And in a fit of anger, the husband hit her. What does the law say? The law would look at it as condemnation. So, you know, there is this huge complexities that come into litigation where how are we going to solve it is a problem. A problem whether the parties get back or whether they decide to uh, move on and uh, settle. The second aspect I would say is with reference to cruelty. Uh, how does one understand cruelty? Ultimately, a judge is a third party who is actually visualizing the problem between the two. The judge brings with herself or himself their own understanding of the issue, which need not be necessarily what the parties have in mind. And we tend to bring in, however much we deny, we would tend to bring in our own biases in the appreciation of evidence. I think that poses a great challenge in our own understanding of family law. The second aspect is that the complexities in litigation today is not just a dispute between parties. It flows between civil law and criminal law. It flows between corporate law it flows between uh, Transfer of Property Act, where there are disputes where people have joint properties which they hold together. It falls between a whole lot of laws, which makes the issue not as easy as is understood. I wanted to start off on this because, you know, uh, Hindu Marriage Act, Indian Divorce Act did have some changes. All, but it followed the entire pattern that existed in the Hindu Marriage Act and the Special Marriage Act are today 60 years uh, in, in, in their application. And what you then see is a whole lot of change in the way in which relationships have emerged. Relationships today, you find people, young people coming to court because they feel that they are unable to get along with each other. You also feel older people coming to court, people in their 50s who now feel that it's not possible for them to live with their spouse. And the approach would always be when older people come to court is that, uh, you know, if you have lived with somebody for so long, why can't you get along with them for some more time? In that, in a way, there is a discrimination. There is an age factor discrimination that you would see if you were actually to look at it through the lens of discrimination. And so then, how do you deal with it? How do you deal with the contribution of the spouse to the marriage in terms of her own workload that she has done for the home is that calculated in any manner when you are looking at maintenance? Because what you are actually seeing is uh, in older marriages, you know, there is not much in terms of uh, alimony that may come to the spouse. Whereas in younger marriages, because the spouses are working in a much higher income bracket, they fight for a much larger share. 
and this actually has a slight difference if you look at if you look at the west the longer you live in a marriage the more you are entitled to your rights because your contribution to your house is taken note of the fact that you are raising your children the fact that you are uh, you know bringing up the house and taking care of the home is some contribution that is taken note of but it is not a factor that actually comes into our system so then you are looking at a relationship which has been there for a long time not getting much relief in the process whereas a relationship that has been there for a shorter time gets much more relief and i also forgot to add that in the complexities that you see in family law today it's not just civil law it's not just criminal law it's not just corporate law when parties own shares they fight over uh, you know larger litigation larger uh, um, rights it's not just sharing apartments which also becomes a dispute it's not just sharing a ration card which in many families poor families actually becomes something that is very relevant to them and that's the and then of course there are issues of information technology that emerge so to my uh, what i would want to say is that the way we are looking at relationships today in marriage there is no such thing as an ideal relationship all of us understand the understanding of a relationship through the economics is complex understanding relationships through the lens of affection emotions and a certain amount of rights that would be required is something that we need to see so and that i think poses a big challenge you know actually most people feel to my mind family law matrimonial law is a very complex area it's not as easy as we make it out to be yes we all settle matters yes we all go through mediation yes we all uh, you know have always come across family disputes that we take it to the court but the fact remains that we are dealing with emotions we are dealing with complex laws we are dealing with both civil and criminal law because the moment a case is filed in one court there is a case that is filed in another court or parties go to the police and your understanding of evidence in both these arenas need to be the same you cannot contradict one from the other one way or the other we are dealing with a very uh, complex system which to my mind is going to become more complex in the future and this is an area whether we like it or not is a increasing branch of litigation Uh, you know you just cannot wish it away or do it away it is an increasing branch of litigation i have not even come to the issue of children which i will come to a bit later but what i want to actually say is that the family law matrimonial law is still based on a common law system it still thinks that both the parties who are coming to it presumes that both the parties who come to the court are on an equal position in our experience we know for a fact that that may not be so we know for a fact that under the family courts act though the lawyers appear you know with leave of court under the law but we appear in all matters you know for a fact that if lawyers are not permitted to appear the husband would always be at a better side he would get better legal advice he would be in a better position to articulate his case while the wife would not be so i mean assume for a fact assume for a time that lawyers are not allowed 
what would be the situation. And therefore then, it's the common law system which accepts or which goes with the presumption that both are equally fitted, does not always apply or in the realm of matrimonial law. Now, the second aspect is that is on the context of appreciation of evidence. An American uh, uh, lawyer has referred to appreciation of evidence as a lawyer's manipulation of proof. <laughs> and I think uh, if you actually look at this, we know for a fact that we as lawyers do manipulate the proof. Then the party comes to us and tells us or narrates their uh, problem, narrates details that need to go into the case. We are not going to just put it in the exact words because we know for a fact that that could be problematic in the appreciation of evidence. You know, for example, the idea or the concept of condonation, which is so archaic, you know, uh, how do you what is the meaning of something like condonation? I remember one case where, you know, uh, condonation, it was on the issue of mental cruelty and condonation was being argued uh, by the spa, by the lawyer for the husband because the parties had remained in a marriage for a very long time. And my response to that was, because it was mental cruelty, we are arguing condonation. If, for example, it was physical violence, which continued for a very long time in the marriage, and on the last occasion, the wife was beaten so badly that she walked out, could we ever say that she con condoned physical violence? Mm. We would not be saying it because we have another legislation in the form of Domestic Violence Act, which addresses physical violence. It addresses mental cruelty also, but that is not so easily understood. Of course, my arguments were not accepted. And on the issue of condonation, the, and on other issues, of course, but condonation was a big aspect. Now, the notion of condonation actually arose from Christian law. And it's very interesting how we see the development of our laws in various ways. And I wanted to share with you on this. Uh, the uh, Indian Divorce Act, which I understood has not been discussed, and therefore I want to share a little bit on the histor history of that law, is uh, as we know, was amended in 2003, but then it was the old legislation of 1865. Now, if you remember the old legislation, it addresses as grounds of divorce, a different set for men and women. For the men, divorce could be granted on the ground of adultery, adultery simpliciter. For the women, divorce could be granted only on the basis of adultery coupled with cruelty, adultery coupled with incest, adultery coupled with a whole host of things. This is the Indian Divorce Act that exists not just in India, but the same law exists in our neighboring countries, Pakistan and Bangladesh, because it is a 1865 law. Now, why did the law emerge this way? When the colony was established, when the British men came out to various other countries, they, it was it was found that if and if they indulged in a act of adultery, the lawmakers felt that being away from their families, that alone should not be a ground of divorce. So you see, it was a historical reason on colonization that actually made a complex grounds for divorce for the women. But at the same time, it was felt that if the woman indulged in a solitary act of adultery, while the men were away in various colonies in the world, 
that should be a ground for divorce. And this is the reason why the um, uh, prior to 2003, because before we got the various amendments in Christian law, adultery alone with its complexities was a ground for divorce. So as you can see, it had nothing to do with any idea of, uh, you know, uh, a religious content. It had everything to do with colonization. When we formulated our own laws, we took certain interesting aspects into it. Let's take the notion of restitution of conjugal rights. Now, uh, the constitutional validity of restitution of conjugal rights was challenged in various courts. The Andhra Pradesh High Court in the case filed by actor Sarita held that forcing an individual to live with their spouse amounted to a violation of their constitutional right. But the Delhi High Court took a different view and held that introducing constitutional law into the family amounted to a bull in a china shop. So you see different views were taken in this arena. And finally, when the matter went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court held that uh, it was not, you know, it was not violative of the law. But if you actually see the notion of constitution of restitution of conjugal rights, that too came from the uh, Indian Divorce Act into our other legislations, which were which evolved in the fifties. And actually, you know, there is a very very famous case called uh, Rukumbai's case, which uh, which uh, which was in the early. Uh, 20th century, which also came as a movie, uh, which was a novel by Kalki, which also came as a movie, where she is forced to go. She is married to a very old man and she is forced to go and live with him and she refuses and she says, I'd rather go to jail. And this is a narrative of a case which, you know, if you, uh, anybody is interested in the historical narrative of this, you can find that in Bombay. And this uh, emerged into our law. The Privy Council held that the restitution of she me had to go back to her husband because she had to her rights had to be restituted. But if you actually look at the idea or the notion of restitution of conjugal rights, can the court, which in a sense represents the state, compel two individuals to live together? Even is that something today when everybody is talking of marital rape to be brought into legislation? Can restitution of conjugal rights be a process that is available under the law? And more so, you know, uh, Islamic law did not have that as a concept, but it was introduced. Today you can file restitution of conjugal rights under Muslim law, but it had it was not recognized as a concept in pure Islamic law. But the Privy Council in various judgments held that it can be done, and we continue to file cases under that and under that process. So therefore, you will find how colonialism had various kinds of impacts in the way in which laws framed and formulated itself in the uh, legislations that came, namely the Hindu Marriage Act and the um, you know other legislations that came through, even after uh, the Special Marriage Act too, which came after the um, after we got our own independence. And today, if you and that is why the notion of condemnation, the notion of pardon, the notion of uh, forgiving which is a great notion. I don't have a dispute with reference to the notion, but that notion forced itself into law. And that is something we need to really 
think about as to how this came in various ways. Now, let's take uh, the way in which uh, various legislations and have come into our system and how the courts can actually look into them. So let's take, for example, what can be the role of a judge and what can be the role of lawyers? We are in a stage where it's highly adversarial. We are constantly fighting and we are bringing in evidence. We are cross-examining a letter written in a fit of anger may not have any meaning. Words set in a fit of anger may not have any meaning, but in the process, we are forced to bring them as evidence. But if you are looking at the role of a judge to, that has developed further, especially when uh, uh, complex laws have come, but at the same time, we are looking at mediation to settle disputes in a more amicable way. It is felt that the role of a judge, and this has been uh, American judge Leonard Edwards in California, who looks at the role of a judge as an administrator, collaborator, convener, and an advocate for marital for the for matrimonial disputes. So you see more so how does the judge look at his role as an administrator? How does the judge look at his role as a collaborator between the parties? How does he convene a more amicable scenario? And how then the judge looks at himself as an advocate for both parties? Because being a judge, you, you probably a judge looks at the problem in, a, in various, in two different ways. But how do you then look at it that way is a interesting notion at least for the future. So therefore, there are multiple roles from an individualized legal determination, that is a judgment, to a broader conception of judicial leadership in the litigation. Now, I know that I'm probably saying something which may not be easily taken, at least today. Uh, it would take probably maybe five years down the line, maybe 10 years down the line, uh, courts looking at cases and parties before them in, in a various different roles. But I think that's something which we need to consider. And in that process, I would see that this would go, in a, go a long way to reduce what Justice Dr. Murlidhar calls uh, litigation neurosis. There are uh, uh, studies also done on this process and he used, uh, the learned judge used this word in a different case where in a contempt, uh, you know, a party got so angry he threw something in the court and the court felt that the frustration that comes to a party is something called a litigation neurosis. And to me, I think this word seemed very interesting because I have never thought of it that way. But looking at our own litigants, when they come to you first, they are so, uh, you know, they look to something. They, they are so positive. They look to see some justice. But over the years, when they keep coming to the court, they really get a kind of neurosis. And how do we then address this neurosis in a complex system of law that is completely frustrating, not just to the litigant, but even to the lawyer. I think lawyers also, I mean, to be very honest, since this is a, uh, a group of lawyers here, we too get a little frustrated when we have to keep dealing with the litigant for a long period of time. I don't know whether you agree with me, but I think that there is some kind of neurosis that sets in when we keep looking at a litigant every day who comes to you, who keeps asking you, who is angry at you, who is then, you know, wanting some kind of a, uh, 
justice in that process. So then how does one um, uh, take this forward? I would look at it as having an interdisciplinary approach. I don't know whether you, do you want to stop here for some discussions? But I would look at it as some amount of a inter interdisciplinary approach. But before that, I just wanted to share with you some amount of uh, judgments, or maybe I can come to that a bit later. But just share with you how, uh, despite the fact that substantive law is very um, rigid in the way in which in the way in which it uh, uh, looks at it. I got a note from Kalayara suit to everyone on Rukumbai's case, which is the case that actually, uh, which I spoke about with reference to restitution of conjugal rates. And thank you so much about that. But it is a judgment worth reading because of the anger and the uh, way in which the judges and the way in which parties, especially Rukumbai, address the court. Now, how do we look at nuanced interpretation of various judgments? I think a lot of development has emerged in this field. But before uh, I think we go into discussions, I just want to share with you one aspect on the issue, on the vexed issue of custody. I remember in a case uh, where the parents were... Uh, fighting over visitation, the child came and told me, I don't want a timetable to see my father. Now, I was wondering what the child meant by a timetable, but what the child had in mind was the visitation order of meeting the father, uh, you know, whatever the court had granted in the child's mind, seemed like a timetable. And the child said, I don't want a timetable to go and meet my father. All of us know for a fact that in the area of custody and visitation, there are no winners. There is a lot amount of manipulation. And at the same time, there is a uh, scenario where the child is, um, you know, where the child does that the child's interests are harmed. However much we may say that the courts have held the best interests uh, of the child has to be taken into consideration with reference to visitation, the fact remains that um, how does one determine best interests? How does one determine um, what can be the approach of the court with reference to the child? We all know for a fact that if you tell your client or if we tell the spouse that you know you must allow the other party to see the child the spouse is not happy uh, and therefore you know if you tell the spouse that this is how it needs to be done and this is what the courts will tell you the spouse is not happy because every party who comes to the court feels that they have the best case and feels that they cannot lose. And in the context of a parent, whatever order a lawyer or a court may give to the parent, the parent is never going to be happy because in their minds, they are the parent, they deserve much more. And this is not how a court needs to actually look into the process. So then the area of custody poses a much greater challenge and which is where I'm not going into the issue of mediation. You've had a discussion of that yesterday, but which is where I believe mediation can really help in a larger way. Let's look at certain discriminatory provisions uh, in our marriage laws, which can cause some amount of uh, difficulties. Let me put it that way. Now, if we look at the, and I'm not going to look at, now let's take section 24 of the Hindu Marriage Act, which, and which came, emerged in the 50s, mind you, which talks about interim, uh, interim maintenance and 25, which talks about permanent maintenance, which 
treats both the spouses as equals. So this is the only law under which uh, either the, the husband can also claim maintenance from the wife. Such a provision does not exist in Christian law. It does not exist in Special Marriage Act. Now, the notion of Section 24 and 25 is built on what we would call as a formal, as a formal model of equality. It assumes that the husband and wife are fixed on an equal frame and therefore they must be treated absolutely equally. Really, in reality, we know for a fact that that is not so. Even if the husband and the wife are earning equally, the wife's contribution is much more. The wife's contribution in terms of bringing up the children, in terms of running the family, even when she is earning in that same way, is not the same. Now, there are, uh, there are in the uh, feminist jurisprudence, three notions of equality. One is the formal model of equality of which I gave you the example of section 24 and 25, which treats both spouses equally. The second is the protectionist model of equality. The protectionist model of equality assumes that women need protection by virtue of their sex. It doesn't look at gender. It looks at women as a notion. And when we, when it looks as, and when you, the examples of protectionist models are many. I can give you two examples. One, uh, if you look at criminal law, the idea of um, women being kept in protectionist homes. Let's, you know, we have many examples of women who are victims of or survivors of violence. Now, what happens is that women of this nature, if they do not have a family, are kept in a vigilance home, while the men who have indulged in this violence may be in jail for a period of time, maybe till the statutory period of time, after which, of course, they may get their bail and they may come out. Whereas the women are kept in vigilance home. Now, this is a notion of protectionist, uh, the protectionist model of equality, where it is presumed that women need protection and therefore uh, they are not treated equally. Now, other concepts of this have been the Factories Act, where, you know, women were not allowed to work in night shifts or as a class. Here, I'd want to say that women as a class were treated differently in the norm in the norm of protectionist employee therefore if a woman wanted to do something also that was not allowed now from this the third notion of equality if you see is called the substantive model of equality here it say here women are here the notion is that is from the formal the formal says women both men and women are equal therefore they don't need any special treatment the protectionist model looks at women need protection. The substantive model looks at, yes, women have been historically discriminated, but they need certain, uh, they definitely need a push in the framework of the law. And that cannot be a protectionist or a uh, formal model. The best example of this is Article uh, 15 and 16 of our Constitution, where any legislation made in favor of women as a class cannot be challenged as being discriminatory. I mean, if you look at our constitutional structure, 14, 15, and 16, equality before the law, if it stood alone without 15 and 16, the legislation any legislation which came specially in favor of women would be challenged. But because of 15, where there is a special uh, requirement which makes, which uh, gives 
not just women of course it gives various other categories but i am looking at that for the purposes of our discussion you will find that that is a classic example of substantive equality and hence but in our matrimonial law i gave you the example of 24 and 25 which treats everyone as equal does not look at the substantive way and hence then how does one look at evidence would have to be applying the tools of the substantive model seeing whether the woman despite the fact that 24 and 25 treat her on a formal equal basis considering whether one can actually push her into a substantive way to look at the contribution of women to her family and that to my mind yeah are some of the tools that one can actually look and address while formulating and considering the evidence uh you um, i there is one case if you if uh, i i'll see if we can recollect that where you know the it, it related to accident claims and the role of the wife uh the uh, matter pertain to compensation the wife had died in an accident in the matter pertain to compensation and uh the madras high court Uh, justice prabhashree devan had was the first judge who actually looked at the role of the wife in her contribution to the home and a similar case when it came to the supreme court in the supreme court it was argued that the wife sitting at home wife was just sitting at home did not contribute anything the court looked at her contribution in taking care of the family as a very important factor in the multiplier and granted compensation based on that and that to my mind was a tool which we could actually look for while we are looking at 24 and 25 the hindu of the of the marriages act this provision does not exist in the other legislations now let's take for example some of the other problematic areas let's look at consanguinity consanguinity is problematic in two ways there is no uniformity in that process under the hindu marriage act uh in the southern states there is an exception the wife can marry a maternal uncle in the northern states such a marriage would be absolutely null and void so customary practices having come into law how does it look at relationships let's look at consanguinity in islamic law you can marry your paternal cousin but marrying a paternal cousin under hindu law will make it null and void so uh you know one of the most famous cases in this area related to you know the actor devanand's brother the hindi actor devanand his brother uh, fell in love with his own maternal cousin wanted to marry her but the marriage was i think he probably had a relationship but the marriage was completely illegal had he been a south indian it would have been a legal marriage so there is this whole uh, you know areas where there is a lot of unclear uh, processes so how do people negotiate their relationships in situations of this kind now let's stay and i'm raising all this because you know there is this huge demand that all our laws must be the same i'm not even using the word of uniform civil code but i'm just telling you that the difficulties that exist in the understanding of our in the understanding of relationships let's take the next example of the special marriage act now 
it again um, brought in features from Christian law, namely that you have to register and give prior no and give one month to three months notice. What is called the bans in Christian law. Now this one month to three months notice has been problematic because in the context of inter-religious marriages, every Tom, Dick and Harry go to the sub-registrar's office, find out the list of names and start protesting. If you remember, if you recollect, one of the most famous cases of this protest was in I think Kodekanal or Uti, when Ayom Sharmila, the activist from uh, Assam, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, wanted to marry, registered a marriage, and somebody raised an objection saying that she should not be allowed to marry and settle down because she was an activist. Activist. Now, and we know for a fact that inter-religious marriages uh, there are groups that watch inter-religious marriages from both sides and go to the families, object to these inter-religious marriages because of the notices that are put up in the sub-registrar's office. So now the question is, do you really need this notice? I'm just posing it. Do you really need a notice where everyone needs to know who's marrying whom? Mm. So to me, this is a, a, and here I want to come to this um, observation of the Supreme Court, where it is held, whether to marry or not marry, or have a relationship when one is an adult, is left to the choice. So where we come in terms of negotiating relationships is, one today in the context of choice. The right to choice is, I think, a right uh, which is granted to us under the law, but how do we actually then take it forward? And the observation that I gave you actually came in the case pertaining to actor Kushbu. That is uh, 2010, 5 SCC, page 600. I think I'm sure all of us can re recollect the history of this case. Where she made certain observations in an interview about premarital sex. Objections were taken to what she had said. Cases were filed under <coughs> 153A IPC on the ground that she was promoting enmity between different groups. 295A, I think, or 292, on the ground that uh, she was insulting Tamil women, Tamil women, and on various grounds. And all these cases, of course, went up to the Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court quashed the criminal cases, but on its observation with reference to the interview, have made this very pertinent observation in the context of choice, which I think is some is constitutionalizing the right of people in India to make their own choice in choosing a partner, in entering into a relationship or into marriage. Now, I come to two more judgments, two very relevant judgments here. The Nalsar case, if uh, that is the um, transgender's rights, which was 2014 SCC 5, volume 5, 438. The Nasar case, which is a very lengthy judgment, but one of the major observations of this case pertain to the right to decide one's own gender. So the court has constitutionalizing the rights from pure civil law of marriage or pure criminal law of 498A, etc. to take it further, where the court now says, this is your right with reference to 
deciding your own gender and it was based on this observation that uh, the uh, you know the uh, you, you have the judgment of uh, the madurai high court that legitimized the right of two transgenders to marry under hindu law on the basis that if one transgender was a woman uh, and declared herself as a woman and the other was a man and they were between the age of 18 and 21 their right of marriage cannot be questioned so here too there was a legitimizing the right to choice which is flowing from this judgment and all of us of course know about that so then you take it further you keep going further you then of course putusami uh, i think is a little complicated for in a marital relationship because while it talks about the right of privacy uh, how does it address privacy uh, you know it talks about the fact that you cannot uh, in, in various spaces it talks about the fact that you cannot uh, record recordings etc but then you know in matrimonial matters now we have huge amounts of recordings that come as evidence so in marriage how does one view privacy i think that question is still left open it's not very clear can a spouse not you know can a spouse not uh, legitimately not get angry uh, if the other spouse is cheating on her and she comes across evidence. So that's something that is not uh, clear in Putuswami. It's kind of, to my mind, left open. But flowing again, you know, if you look at other judgments, Navtej Singh Johar. Navtej Singh Johar, that uh, in 2018, that struck down 377, which again looked into choice. The right of people to choice. Of course, you know, striking down 377 has only decriminalized the act. The concept of whether, uh, you know, um, it takes rights into civil law. That is, you know, whether two men can get married under Hindu law or not is still a question thrown open. Because under the Hindu law, based on the Madurai judgment, it's only... So far, only the rights of transgenders, one being a woman and other being a man, has come. The reason being, of course, anybody can get married. I mean, you know, now 377 is decriminalized. You want to go through your religious form, you do so. But then do civil rights of inheritance, alimony, and marital rights flow from is a question that is left unanswered. And last but not the least, in terms of right to choice, is Joseph Shine versus UOI in the with reference to the Supreme Court striking down section 497 of the IPC. And it's very interesting that, uh, you know, in 1988, the first, there were various cases that actually challenged adultery. One pertained to Saumitri Vishnu versus Union of India, which also came from Chennai, which was challenged by Nalini Chidambaram in the Supreme Court. She challenged 497. She was unsuccessful. The other was Revati versus Union of India, which I argued in the Supreme Court, challenged 198 of the CRPC that didn't give right to a wife to file a complaint. We were unsuccessful. And after so many years, 497 has now been struck down on the ground that it's discriminatory in a very simple manner. Namely that when the husband alone has the right to file a complaint and the wife does not have such a right, the law itself is very discriminatory. And I think uh, these are areas where today from the time when Section 9, I mean, restitution of conjugal rights was dismissed, even uh, from the time when the other uh, Somitri Vishnu and Revati were dismissed, 
to today when you have judgments which have really constitutionalized family law in a much greater way you find that they are giving spaces for or new kinds of relationships to negotiate and also looking at spaces for existing relationships in a marriage to negotiate in a different way number 1 ma'am i have two questions to ask the most controversial uh, area remains in the tamil nadu registration of marriage act there the personal appearance of uh, the party is not compulsory probably the legislature contemplates a parda nashin or muslim movement who are not supposed to appear before the public authority my predicament is that i have come across cases or i have myself conducted cases where women are so easily cheated and in my case where i appeared for one girl she was asked to come and sign as a witness actually she was shown to be the wife and she has mistakenly signed the papers without verifying finally the man came with the certificate of marriage that you are my wife come and leave with me so we had to rush to the high court uh, explain the situation got the interim order and took nearly 4 years for me to fight with the court ultimately uh, by vexing over the delay the matter got settled so this is a gray area where i think dispensing with the appearance of one of the parties to marriage before the registrar is something very mischievous and that should be um, a compulsory appearance of party so that the registrar may get convinced that it is not by fraud or force or something one or so at take on that i agree with you because you know we have what is called as royapuram marriages yeah 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 and uh, where uh, because, you see the difficult the all, hmm. because under section 7a you can have a swayamvarya they marriage in the and today what what has been happening is this uh, you see even though i support the right to choice it has to be a proper constructive choice yeah um yeah. and um, the the difficulty you have is that a the choice may be bad or b even if the choice is good the community and the cast groups may start attacking the two individuals exactly exactly so that, that is, is also a problem so the difficulty the issue i would agree with you that the act should require parties to appear because here hmm. also we are having this problem where uh, they appear before the uh, advocate and um, some certificate is issued hmm. and then they do not even and we have had this registration where they don't even go for the registrar they sit in the car and exactly. the registration is done mm. now the there is a judgment of course of the madras high court of justice pn prakash and justice yes. rajesh shoran which is now held that uh, if any woman challenges this kind of a marriage it has to be a null and void marriage mm. uh, it's only in the context of women but definitely i think uh, there is room for amendment of this law because uh, this uh, and uh, you know this uh, and also that this registration by lawyers you know that also is something which the court has really frowned upon and, and therefore this is a problem peculiar to our state but i think i agree i would agree with you that we need to uh, maybe look at uh, a moment for the registrar to satisfy uh, himself that there is no element yeah, of satisfy process satisfy himself it yes doesn't. definitely and that's the observation of the court and it's a very difficult uh, thing and many most of the marriages are um, done in such haste Why, in, we can't say the registration per se is illegal yeah. and we can't say the registration per se no. is illegal because the personal law permits and and the register has to satisfy that there was a previously kind of solemnized marriage as per the personal law which is subsequently registered but the issue is the person support it's true but the judgment is actually giving a lot of uh, room for us to challenge these marriages the bench marriages but by the women by the women folk by the, yes we have had problems of young <laughs> men also <laughs> exactly 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 so the second question is melan mantinka it's something i just been um, uh, 
um, lingering in my mind for the past 25 years because I, I do agree with you and it should be a matter of principle and policy that uh, matrimonial jurisprudence should never be an adversarial part of the proceedings. But the situation is that when there is no peace and the parties come to the court fully shattered, having resorted to all the conciliation within the family or among themselves and having lost faith um, um, in each other, almost with uh, extreme degree of uh, what is called uh, an ill will or some kind of uh, um, enmity or uh, in, uh, what is called uh, inimical relationship only they come to the court. So though we are called upon not to conduct the cases in an adversarial situation, I find that the parties are at always at doggerheads. I see a lot of uh, scene where the husband does not even turn to see the wife or the child even, and the wife uh, virtually cursing the husbands in the court in whatever language possible. So when the jurisdiction is supposed to be adversarial, when the parties are not cordial and they don't love each other and the love is lost and there is no love loss, how do you expect the courts to, what is called, minimize the um, animosity between the parties so as to go for a peaceful adjudication? Okay, see, the point is substantive law, that is the, the substantive laws, that is the Hindu Marriage Act, the Special Marriage Act, all our laws are so adversarial. So mm. even if parties are coming before you, they do not have the luxury of thinking of the good times. They are forced to think of the bad times because cruelty. I mean, you cannot think of a good time. You can't even put a good time in your pleading mm. uh, because that will be condonation. That will be condonation. Yeah. So... Um, uh, the difficulty is, yes, the, there are some, I mean, it takes all kinds of people in this world. So you do have some who are going to be highly adversarial. Mm. Uh, you know, even if you have irretrievable breakdown as a ground for divorce, as in the West, you're going to have very, very aggressive, violent people. Mm. You know, uh, otherwise we would not have, and most countries also would not have laws on domestic violence, even the mm. West. Yeah. So you will definitely have such kind of people who will need a different uh, approach from the court, also. You know, but then there could be a there could be a vast majority who will not come into the court. See, the I I am a supporter of the irretrievable breakdown concept. I'm a supporter of that. But it, ne it needs to come with a lot of support system in our country because in rural India, you can't have a sway where the husband files a case on irretrievable breakdown and throws his wife out. That would be the difficulty in a country like ours. But as a concept, it is definitely something I would support. So how do you deal with it where the spouses are willing to come to a, you know, uh, are a little more negotiable, willing to negotiate? Yes, then you can have a, uh, there can be some, probably mediation is the best. But where they are not willing to do so, then the court has to be strong and hard on them. There is no other choice. Um, I've got one more uh, yeah. uh, question. So, uh, what is called, uh, when you think of uh, um, and another ground, you could have seen the previous webinar, a uh, group discussion by Justice Anand Venkatesh, uh, Justice Vimala, yeah. and uh, Gopika Nambiyar, where mm -hmm. they had a panel discussion on this. Of course, um, we also believe that uh, to put an end for the never ever ending or never ending. Uh, a long drawn battle between the parties. At one point or another, there should be an element of consensus, or the ground may be inserted as a ground of a divorce called irretrievable broken down marriage. Again, for that, we we'll have to allege something. She made it incompatible, or he made it uh, irretrievable. So there are no parameters. For example, for five years. Uh, such a ground cannot be uh, impressed upon, or only after the end of five years, 
So you cannot say that at the first year of the marriage itself, or can we say the marriage is broken down? It all depends each and every cases. So what are all the parameters to include uh, the ground of um, irretrievable broken down marriage as a ground of divorce? When it is uh, alleged by one party, putting um, the fault on another side and another side refuting this. If it is done by the court as an inference, after appreciation of the evidence, I understand. But when it is made a ground in the act, what have to be done is the parties have to adduce the evidence. Again, we go to adversarial uh, part of the story to prove the ground of uh, what is called a, the broken down marriage being a, a ground of divorce. What is your take, ma'am? See, most women are insecure when there is a divorce filed by a man. Insecure on the ground that, uh, you know, what will they do? Uh, where will they go? and social stigma and the fact that a man may find it easy to get another spouse yeah that's a ground mm. reality whereas it might not be so easy for a woman to find another uh, husband or a man in her life i think these are the three factors that weigh in a woman's mind in her resistance to giving a divorce yeah. Of course, mm -hmm. of course, mm -hmm. there can be some people who fight on egos. We are not looking at that category now. Therefore, how this these three need to be addressed: the namely that the social stigma and finding a different spouse cannot be addressed by the court or by the uh, process. But her economic needs is something that actually needs to be addressed. I feel that. At the high courts, now you know the Supreme Court in one judgment has said only we have the power to dissolve the marriage, etc. But I feel that the high court should have the power because by the time the case comes to the high court, by the time the high court hears it, there is a very long period, you know, it's almost five years, seven years. And I think at that stage, the high court can contemplate the issue at least of her economic needs. Mm -hmm. Children would have grown up by then. That is a factor that needs to be taken through. You know, uh, urban women, the idea and notion of social stigma and finding another spouse probably is reducing. You know, uh, is reducing. We do find women who marry again, but uh, I'm not saying that that's an easy task. It's reducing among them. Rural women, it's very, very difficult. Very, very not going to be easy for them. Yeah. Yes. So the, the disparity in India is something that after all, you know, the kind of women who come to court are not uniform. Ru mm. They are rural. They are from different communities. They are from different religions, caste, all kinds of... Uh, all kinds of culture comes to the court and the, mm. it's, therefore the role of the trial judge is to actually understand the culture. I think that's to my mind is very important. It's very important for the trial judge to understand the background and the culture from which the parties are coming. Okay. And, uh, the, law, the last straw from my end is this. I think uh, when the previous government um, uh, left the ruling party scene, UPA2, they contemplated, uh, I remember a law, a bill wherein uh, uh, when the husband uh, seeks divorce, he has to give half of the property or income to the wife. Probably it is a case in US, I come to know. Um, do you support, uh, will it be uh, an advantage or a measure to protect the economic interest of the spouse or as usual, we keep but the advocates will make the woman to abuse or misuse the law so as to take the entire family for uh, yeah, or, uh, yeah, revenge because here uh, still there are family we are living together under the same roof. Under section 498, we include everybody in the family, including the latest newborn infant. So if that okay. is the bill introduced, what is your take? Do you support the bill? Okay, the extended family, all right. So, you know, the idea which they borrowed in that was the community property okay most of the mm. countries abroad have the notion of the community property which means that after marriage 
anything that is purchased belong equally to the spouses spouses yeah so if the if the husband purchases a house he is the wife is a homemaker it belongs equally to the both the spouses now mm. the advantage of this is that if you are in a marriage for a longer period of time if it is a 20 25 year old marriage 30 year old marriage obviously there will be a greater community property and when there is mm. a divorce the wife will get her equal share at her older age maybe at the age of 50 etc mm. and if you are a young marriage you are a young couple let's say uh married just for a short time one year five years not much community property um then you will get you won't get anything you know we know anything. for a fact that many women come to us saying the husbands have filed their cases in america and the american law does not give them anything now the hmm. notion of community property in the west takes note of the fact that every both are equal it's based on a formal model of equality but at the same time um parties move on in life that's the notion there and if mm. you are there if you are older you are entitled to a larger share now in india actually the reverse is happening you know older women are not getting much because mm. their husbands didn't earn that my kind of money i mean a man who's in his 50s may not be earning the way younger people have been earning yeah so the in in the indian context what they get since we don't have community property is much mm -hmm. less okay because he'll come and say i don't have anything to live by i have only my pension i have this i have that etc that's what he would have spent so, for the son's education or daughter's marriage yes. I, so therefore the notion of community property is very different now the other issue is how do you look at rural india mm. rural india operates as we know on a very different level uh there is money held jointly by families the husband may not have much they may be living in a joint family where it might be the father in law who is actually Mm. uh the head of the family putting the cut of the family mm. yeah mm. uh or they may stay in a house which belongs to the father in law so i think mm. um when this law was brought in and then of course it went back because there was a protest about it saying mm. that it was not uh you know it was no it was going to be harmful and then it was referred to a select committee but then it has lapsed i think but i That's think lapsed. we need to discuss or at least we need to now let's take for example litigations coming courts can mm. in mediation at least one can discuss that and say that this is what the wife should get i think we need Very to well. go and push it a little further exactly. and take it on thank you It's a very insightful answer, ma'am. Thank you, <laughs> Sumitra Chakravarti. Ma'am, my question to you is regarding the marriages registered under the Foreign Marriages Act, ma'am. Okay. 1969. Hmm. And when um, dispute arises, ma'am, we approach the court under the Special Marriage Act. Yes. But when both the parties are residing abroad, then how to take it forward, ma'am? I think. See, uh, this is what I do. so i am not sure whether others may have different methods if both parties are residing abroad i advise them to file a divorce there i don't see any point in or you know if they are unable to come to india because our laws now expect the parties to be present in person uh, you know at or uh, you know unable to be coming through there you know and what i do is i enter in, in the in the pleadings of the foreign court uh, i put in all the terms that we can put in india namely that it is consensual namely that the parties got married uh, in india uh, and uh, but uh, they are unable to come to india they accept the jurisdiction of the foreign court 
they will not file any litigation against each other or their families they will not file all those clauses that we put in a mutual consent i so i add it there so that the parties can then get their marriages dissolved because the law permits that no see the jurisdiction with reference to matrimonial law is as you can see where the marriage took place or where they last resided together or where they uh, or where the respondent resides right so i mean all the three jurisdictions that you get and if the parties are unable to come i think it's better that they if you recollect uh, the uh, sukanya's case in the case of sukanya hmm. she had a marriage she married in a temple temple yes they got a foreign marriage again registered in some other country she filed in india but the court and the husband challenged it the court held that the marriage is under the hindu law but if you if you are totally unable to come to india uh, and uh, foreign it's uh, it's a marriage which is before the consulate is it if it is a foreign marriage is act so if it is before the consulate and the parties are hindus both the courts will have jurisdiction that is courts in india as well as in the in a foreign country so depending on their convenience i would i would take it to the foreign country you know and put all the clauses that we put here especially the one that both of them have consented to the divorce because irretrievable breakdown is not a ground for us and one should not challenge it later in india based on narsimhalu's case therefore you can put it that way prapavdi ma'am yes, ma'am our legislation enacted the personal laws i mean personal laws irrespective of our religion the main purpose of to uh, what is it um, uh, regulate the matrimonial relationships at present also we have discussed so many grounds for reunion so many grounds for the divorce and etc but at present scenario are new and young generations who are adapting the concept of live in relationship mm. in most of the times and most of the cases also filed before the honorable court of high court and the honorable court of the supreme court also sometimes mm. the supreme court also uh, pronouncing the judgment in favor of the women because he, she is coming under the weaker section uh, so then they have to, i mean we have to provide the some protection related actually with absence of the statutory provisions our supreme court uh, declaring the uh, favorable uh, judgments in favor of the women madam at present what is my question madam yeah. with absence of the statutory provisions if we are uh, i mean we are means the honorable court which is protecting such kind of the women means the young generations may also think that so in front of i mean uh, along with the supreme court is also uh, giving the some type of the protections uh, and we can also able to get the maintenance in that point of view uh, the young generations may adopt the same system means in future what is the stage of our personal laws madam what is the stage of personal law family law because we are discussing about that uh, um, uh, marriage means we have to follow some conditions but when we are taking the concept of live in relationship there is no meaning of that one when okay. the young generations who are following the concept there is no need of that personal law so in this oriented what is your opinion no ma'am? i don't think that there can be you know see there are two things here one is that the concept of live in relationship it's not as if it didn't exist in india before mm. 1955 and you know before the laws came right Yes. people they were different communities that had different methods of marriage for example uh, the idea the bombay school and all that you know you know you would have known the bombay school um, did uh, there were people young there were couples who the divorce the idea the notion of divorce also was simple the that the marriage was shastrik and that the marriage was a uh, uh, sacrament is essentially of certain communities right uh, otherwise there are other communities which would just divorce in a very simple manner 
So it's not as if these notions of live in relationship and uh, other things didn't exist prior to 1955. Now, 1955, you made a uniform law uh, of all the forms of marriages. In some sense, it did make marriage as a sacrament, when in fact, with certain communities, it was not. So now, what you are finding today is that idea of notion of live-in relationship, uh, the way we are terming it is very Western, but it did exist. Uh, and the law looks at it differently. See, for example, presumption and two people are living together for many years. There's no marriage. Okay. Yes. Two Muslims are living together, two Hindus are living together, two Christians are living together. There's no marriage. The court has held that there is a presumption in favor of marriage. Okay. Yes. Sometimes in a realistic way, even if there is a marriage, supposing the wife has run away, come somewhere, they've had a marriage, all the evidence has been destroyed by the husband, let's say. The uh, marriage, so everything. Then also, the courts have sort of come around in favor of presumption of marriage. So in a way, you could say, those are also live-in relationships. Yeah? Yes. And courts have held, and that is again, you know, you have uh, this uh, uh, Chanmuniya's judgment. Yeah? Yeah, man. Uh, that was in uh, 2010. Uh, yes. Kanmuniya versus Virendra Kumar Singh, where there is a very nuanced interpretation of substantive law with reference to living relationships, where it says strict proof of marriage is not required. So if you're looking at living relationships in that context, there are strict, there is, uh, there is a marriage. Court says it is a marriage. Now if you're looking at living relationships the way the modern school sort of looks at it, <laughs> what you find is two issues. Courts have held that, uh, if you remember, I don't recollect the judgment, but there is a judgment where a married woman lived with a man and uh, sought compensation. Bangalore, Karnataka judgment, she sought compensation under the Domestic Violence Act. She, she claimed that the, the relationship was lived in. The court held that that was not so. So now, if you are living for 10 years, 20 years, there is presumption of marriage. If you are living for a short time and there is violence in the marriage, you can claim from the Domestic Violence Act. So I will not say, Ms. Prabhavati, that marriages are uh, not, you know, they are still alive and kicking in terms of the law. But we need to see that there is a change. There is a paradigm shift in the way young people are looking at relationships from the last century, let's say, 2000 onwards. Yes. There is a paradigm shift. Yes. So the way we look at it may not be the same. Young people looking at it. So I just want to say that uh, we can make ourselves very... We can. It is. It is an interesting branch of law. It's challenging. Every day we meet different clients, and you can come into this case. It's not something that you know. I think it's a very. Uh, it's a very good. A good branch to practice. Because you are actually dealing with people. Mm -hmm. You know. You look at it this way. If you are looking at a civil matter, you know. Uh, a company matter. Yeah. It's not so emotional. But here you train yourself to be uh, emotional in a different way. So it's yeah. challenging. There is um, one question from Ujwala. Can I, can I write yeah, that? Yeah, can please, I ask please, that? Please. She yeah, says yeah. that uh, uh, do you have any suggestions for proceedings in family court to be a bit smooth? It is very cumbersome presently. <laughs> okay. Uh, mm. I think all of us may, Ujwala, uh, all of us will have our own um, 
this is a very interesting question that you have posed and i think we really need to have a lot of discussions on that especially now mm. with covid you know where uh, we still don't know how we are going to get this done to my mind i think the family court act which only talks about two issues i have a problem with which says that the role of the counselors is to um, is to protect the family that's not protect some other word to save the family that's one problem the second is the whole cumbersome process even where you expect the client to come every day at least in the southern ports i don't know ujwala where you are from but it's very ujwala kadrekar so i don't know where you are from at least in the southern ports it's very cumbersome we expect the party to come every day and the frustration of seeing your spouse you know whom you don't want is a high tense matter i think one suggestion for me is do not put so many cases every day you know you have mm. i don't know how it is in madurai here we no, have it's equally, equally consistent at least 200 100. people per day yeah. yeah and you know that is very frustrating you take your leave and you know worst thing is you take leave keep coming to the court you lose your pay you lose your job all that those processes of the family court act if we one is to to settle you know to make that a little more simpler i'm sure it's like that in mumbai you know she said That's that she is looking with indra jay singh ma'am and she did a session together in madras judicial academy okay you mean you and both of us ujwala okay yes yes <laughs> ma'am yes ma'am that... you uh, ma just justice chandru justice ramu subramanyam we all have done uh, quite a few sessions in madras judicial academy uh, if you recollect uh, on uh, domestic violence law uh, so could you hear me ma'am yeah yeah, just, yeah yeah because you know i can hear you Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, if you could briefly recollect, ma'am, I mean, we have done quite a few sessions on domestic violence. Okay, law. I can't see you. You know, unfortunately. <laughs> no, I didn't want to. Uh, And, uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So yeah. this is when Justice Rama Subramanian was in Chennai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was in Madurai. He was uh, he had a few from Madurai. And, okay, he came uh, from there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Justice Kanra and Justice Chandru and we all have. Been, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, Ujwala, you know. Indra has been the Indra yeah. Jay Singh was the pioneer of the Domestic Abs- Violence Act. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. He has started that, and many yeah. ways I find that the Domestic Violence Act gives more space for negotiation. Absolutely, okay. uh, it has its teething problems, but yeah. then you know that is how it needs to be. But I think you know, you know, in the American Bar Association, uh, every I don't know whether Justice Vimala said this. in your meeting yesterday mm. uh, she has said this earlier that the american bar association every 10 years they scrutinize every legislation and give suggestions i think that's a very brilliant idea yeah you know yeah. but yeah. we don't have any empirical research yeah. on on the way in which our cases are happening in our courts Right. You know, uh, right. unfortunately, you yes. take Juvenile Justice Act for example. A huge problem is there. Yes. Because uh, um, you know, the sixteen to eighteen youngsters coming there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love affairs, so to speak, are clubbing the system. So the, every ten years, I think, in small ways, if at least our courts permit us, we need to see the. i think that that was a that's a very interesting thing for us to follow you know just to see and then they offer suggestions on change if any so when how i look at it is it is i mean we are in the 21st century and we have family law since 1955 yes and i agree we, yeah and we have a domestic violence law which came only in 2005 what i feel is man domestic violence law is uh, addressing domestic violence but when it comes to uh, family laws it is only t- uh, giving relief and rights to women but uh, what about the violence that she is also mentioning rather she is uh, definitely 
putting it in her petition but that is not been addressed at, in family courts and then we are saying that women is making so many complaints in so many different courts so, so we really need to address these issues ma'am you know i feel very strongly about it because even see, in fact, yeah no no i remember indra coming to chennai and i think you all did a training with the magistrates right yes ma'am yes ma on the dv act yeah right but right. still the dv act even though the act says 3 months i think 3 years standard time 3 yes, most of yes, most of the courts in india absolutely. i would say just my absolutely. absolutely um so the point is i and the other aspect is that the magistrate courts don't have mediation mm. uh you know i think um, you know if you look at family courts a large number of cases are getting settled okay the trial cases are much less i'm sure i don't know srinivasa and all of you whether you'll agree with me uh, yeah. the trial cases are less the, ma- the many of them are getting settled but in the magistrate courts there are no uh, you know uh, we don't have uh, and sometimes you need a third party to push a settlement mm-hmm. to push a settlement discussion uh, both of us as two lawyers you know sometimes we are unable to do so you know sometimes if you say something to your client they misunderstand you because they think that's the best case either way it is like that and if you have a third party i personally find that it is a little easier to negotiate use it use the space as negotiation therefore the magistrate courts are not having that at all yeah they don't have a mediation uh, process what, yeah what i have been at least in tamil nadu i don't know about other places i i think ma'am i'm doing i'm doing uh, the monitoring of this law uh, and what i have been observing is lately the procedures in magistrate courts is the moment there is a dv case that has been filed parties are sent for mediation now uh, okay. you know yeah by the, in the same court but by a different magistrate this is a practice that i have been observing and um, uh, i i feel ma'am again like you know because a woman has already come to the court her consent is definitely not taken into account as a practice so the parties are referred for mediation uh, my, my concern is women has already exhausted all the services and then she has approached the court you know why are we not following the spirit of the law you know that she wants protection she wants her residence to be secured and uh, unfortunately our family is uh, family laws are not taking care of that okay ujwala yeah. i believe that if you want protection order yeah and if you want immediate maintenance order yeah and if you want uh, what are the yeah if you want let's say these two for the time being i'm not yeah. to recollect yeah the court must immediately intervene yes okay. yes ma'am exactly once you immediately intervene and grant these two orders then mm. it puts the wife a little on an equal par with that uh, of the absolutely husband. ma'am and she will she is in a better position so to negotiate so when you are on equal par with that of the husband mm. you have a better negotiation power yes let's put it that way yes ma'am Ultimately, absolutely litigations need to be settled so yeah. you you have a better negotiation power absolutely. and especially in a city like bombay you know where uh, the right to reside in the matrimonial home is very very complex yes uh, because uh, you have that's the only space a woman has she has yeah. no other space yeah um, you need that right of residence and right of maybe interim maintenance and right of custody those are the main three things that come now you need the negotiation for the larger relief if you are asking for compensation yeah uh, and for uh, anything else mm. because if you are asking for custody the husband also will have a right to ask for visitation absolutely absolutely so those absolutely. are rights that need to be negotiated but i agree with you that immediate order see like for example i i feel that injunctions mm. need to be given if you are send an injunction party for negotiation and that only delays the process exactly ma'am so okay. the mediation process should not be used as a tool to delay ma'am i i also feel very strongly that uh, dv act uh, can be filed in family court only in pending litigation can you be a bit louder yeah yes Hello? i also believe yeah. that yeah, yeah yeah tell me yeah can you hear me ma'am yeah i can hear you 
uh, what I feel is uh, uh, generally uh, DV uh, domestic uh, uh, the DV cases can be filed in family court only in pending litigation. Um, I, you know, um, and uh, so again, like you know, um, so uh, either uh, one of the party has to file a case in the court, and um, then only she can proceed under domestic violence law. So uh, again, you know, not, uh, yeah. I also think because of the provision under the DV Act that yeah. in notwithstanding the provision, any court can you know grant yeah. any yeah. of the relief. I also think family courts must entertain domestic violence, domestic violence yeah. uh, proceedings because it's now becoming multi. Yeah, ma'am. One Absolutely. court here, She's one court yeah. there. Yeah. You have to run from each court. Yeah. So, but then courts are not accepting. Unfortunately, they accept it only as an interim order. In yes. Uh, Gita, yes. ma'am, there is one interesting perspective what Ujwala says. And uh, I understand you stating that uh, pending litigation before the family court or district court. I think the wife or husbands are not supposed to go to any other independent proceeding in the criminal law. They may invoke the same power of either DV Act or uh, any other provision under the same proceeding. Who should they go for uh, before the JM for the purpose of uh, yeah, that may be know, clubbed together. That's what Ujwala, I, I think, I think uh, she some contemplates. Judgments, like some one or two judgments of different courts have said that you can, you should do it. But uh, hmm. some people file a fresh case. Right? That's the what? courts are not happening a fresh DV case. Hmm. Exactly. That's what she, I think That's Ujwala did say. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think yeah. Ujwala feels that that is a problem. Yeah. They are yeah. not accepting. Yeah. Uh, family courts, sorry. Family courts are not accepting. Family court, they don't accept them. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a problem. You know, I, I don't know why. <laughs> but probably they feel they are overburdened. No, ma'am, actually, uh, this uh, section 26 does not allow, ma'am. It's very unfortunate. Uh, yeah. Section yeah. It's, it's an embargo. It's an embargo. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. It should but be amended. Orders, yeah. Because after all, you know, earlier interim orders of injunction can be filed. So yeah. why not this? Yeah. You know, even before the act came. Thank you so, so this much. This kind of deliberation you, will Ujwala. make uh, legislator. I think Ujwala ma'am and uh, Gita ma'am can make use of this deliberation and uh, a way forward. Uh, by placing before the authorities, either in the judicial academy or in any other better forum, I hope there is a scope for uh, what is called an amendment or something more than uh, out of these deliberations. Yeah, we have to think out of the box. I think in this uh, exactly in this yeah, branch, loud thinking. Yeah, yeah loud thinking. Yeah. Thank so you. for that matter, I thank Ujwala, ma'am, for the very uh, pertinent uh, uh, question. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks Thank you, Ujwala, sir. Thank, Thank you, you Ujwala. Yeah, I request uh, Hemalata to speak a few words to you and to the audience. Thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful session, really. Excellent session. Totally a thread analysis of the entire uh, thing and all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you, Srinivas Agwan, for having me today. And it was a great pleasure. I enjoyed talking. And, uh, you know, also... Uh, it was really looking at, uh, it's nice to look at law in a very different way, threadbare way, rather than, you know, when we are just litigating. Yeah? So thank you very much. All the best for everyone. And uh, I'm very happy to find that the last session happened to be one of the very different, insightful, and not a monotonous or a usual format you have followed. An insightful, uh, what is called a journey into the various uh, facets of the matrimonial as a whole. One of the very, uh, what is called, uh, um, I'm in search of words. I'm very happy to say that uh, the session proved to be very um, useful and constructive. So a very special thanks to you for being here patiently and um, enlightening the chosen audience. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you so <laughs> much. And I really enjoyed uh, talking and I hope everybody enjoyed listening. Uh, sure. No doubt. No doubt. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.